That, of course, is a danger, and you could say that the history of Northern Ireland over the last 50 to 100 years provides evidence for that ha having happened on occasions. But I think this time it's possible to be a bit more hopeful because the balance, uh, most of the extra money, most of the extra £450 million per annum over the next two years seems to be dedicated towards investment, in other words, being put into transport improvement, digital improvement, or very importantly, improving the structure of the health service here. Uh, that, I think, gives some grounds for hope that this is going to help to improve the long-term sustainability of growth in the Northern Ireland economy rather than being simply the sort of proverbial short-term sticking plaster. So the British taxpayer may actually get a bit of bang for their buck this time then? Well, hopefully, yes, there will be a general return, not just to Northern Ireland, but to, to the UK as a whole, if it can lead to the sort of potential for the Northern Ireland economy to grow more rapidly, so a win-win situation. Isn't the problem here, though, that, I mean, were Northern Ireland an independent company, it would have a deficit to GDP ratio of something like 29 or 30 per cent. I mean, it would be completely incapable of standing on its own two feet. Well, that's right, but of course that's a hypothetical. It isn't an independent country, it's a region of the United Kingdom. Yes, it does have a transfer, as it might be turned from the UK exchequer, but so, of course, does every region across the United Kingdom bar London and the east and southeast of England. So Northern Ireland is not unique in that regard, but it is true that in sort of proportional terms, our uh, so-called transfer or subsidy subvention is large, but come back to the same sort of point, to the extent that this money is well used and invested, then conceivably in 10, 15 years time, and it, it is a long-term challenge, that degree of subsidy or support for the Northern economy might be, we might be able to reduce it. Yes, you mentioned some of the other measures there that might benefit Northern Ireland's economy. I mean, equivalence on uh, corporation tax rates with the Irish Republic that was one area that the DUP were pushing for. It doesn't look like they've got their own way there. No, but you see, the thing was that that has always been conditional and it remains conditional. At least two big things, important things, have to happen to make it possible. We need the restoration of devolved government here at Storm at the North Island. And, of course, we wait to see whether that's going to be possible in the next week or so. And secondly, any future or restored government here has to demonstrate that it has the sort of fiscal stability, the ability to balance its own books uh, to make that feasible. How damaging would it be for Northern Ireland if, post-Brexit, a hard border with the Irish Republic were reimposed? It, it, it could be very damaging, but it, it has to be said that uh, all the major political players, London government, Dublin government, are very much on the same page here in terms of saying that the common travel area, which has existed since Irish independence in 1921, should be preserved, and as few tariff and custom barriers as possible should be uh, there on the, the, the land border. So is there room for some optimism around Northern Ireland's prospects post-Brexit? I mean, clearly the, the population in Northern Ireland voted to remain part of the EU. Yes, it, it did vote 56 to 44 percent in terms of rebate. In terms of optimism, it's, it's a, it does pose an economic challenge, but provided that we get the policy response right uh, and provided that we don't use Brexit as some sort of cover-all excuse for government or other types of failures in the private sector, I, I think the North Island economy can continue to grow, and indeed the available economic forecast suggests that that will be the case.